This is the geology of gold deposits session. If you're in the wrong room, you can leave now. I won't be offended, <laughs> but I hope you stay. Thanks for being here. Uh, today we have six talks by um, a kind of a diverse crowd. You'll hear about different deposit types and, and deposits that are within the Western US primarily. Just so you know, the talk on the La Cienega district um, had to be canceled. Greg couldn't make it to this presentation today. And we don't have many rules. Um, we'll just try to run on time. Each speaker has 20 minutes. And in the interest of giving them their maximum time for their presentation, um, we may have a few minutes left over each talk for questions. But if you'd like a, a more in-depth discussion with any of the speakers, please stick around or come back at around 4.30, and uh, we can extend that discussion at that time. All I forgot is to introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Brooke Clarkson. Uh, I'm a geologist with SRK Consulting based in Reno, Nevada and I am the chair of this session. So we're gonna start it off with Carl Brechtel from Corvus Gold. Carl has over 35 years of mining industry experience and specializes in the design and development of both open pit and underground projects. He is currently chief operating officer of Corvus Gold Incorporated. Prior to joining Corvus, he held various project development roles with Engle Gold Ashanti, including pre-feasibility manager and manager of underground mining. Mr. Brechtel's extensive operational and project development history in various geologic settings spans projects in North America, Australia, South America, and Africa. Carl holds a bachelor's in geological engineering from the University of Utah, and also a Master of Science in Mining Engineering from the University of Utah. Welcome, Carl. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you today about um, Southwest Nevada, around Beatty, Nevada, uh, which is the site of our projects and some recent gold discoveries. Um, I, I know this violates all the rules for slides, so I don't expect you to read that, but we're, Corvus Gold is a Canadian junior explorer, so we're required to show this thing. For any of you going to Toronto, I'm sure you're going to see this a lot tomorrow. Um, Nevada, um, we, for our company, it's a it's a great location to work. We can work 365 days of work. Um, it's a big producer, uh, 5.3 million ounces in 2015. And um, from 95 to 2015, 140 million ounces. So it's one of the largest gold producing areas in the world. We're working down in what's called the Walker Lane trend in south, southern Nevada. The, the trend hosts some of, some of the major discoveries in the history of mining in Nevada, Comstock, Round Mountain, and uh, the one that's of most interest to us is the bullfrog. So this is what we're looking for. Um, this is the bullfrog mine operated for about 10 years. Um, production was about 2.6 million ounces of gold. Ver very low production costs. That's back in uh, back in the late 90s. So that's an incredible operating class for that time. 92% um, gold recovery and about a two and a half gram per ton grade. So that was what we were looking for when we came into the area. Um, the the district itself is um, related to a, a large caldera to the east of the district called the Timber Mountain Caldera. Um, it's over, over time has uh, erupted many times laying down thick layers of tough ash and, and we see at least three ma major gold events over about a three million year period. So the, 
the largest discovery bullfrog was about 10 million MA. Um, our deposits are farther to the north. How does this thing work? Does anybody? Oops. I should have checked that out. Our deposits are in the north west corner of the map. Um, those are related to an event about 11 and a half million MA. Um, and our, the primary deposit in that is what we call Sierra Blanca and Yellow Jacket. The third event, 12.5 million MA is a deposit in the southeast corner, uh, our mother lobe project. Um, this map shows a bunch of different properties. Our, our property outline is this light blue um, outline that you see. So we've started in the northwest corner at what we call North Bullfrog. Uh, we, we got control of the mother load property, which was a historic mining property from the, from the late 80s. Um, and then we've extended our claim blocks down to the southeast and then, and then south from North Bullfrog to capture more terrain. In the meantime, uh, whereas we were the only company really working in the area up until about three years ago, uh, we now have neighbors. Anglo Gold Ashanti is actively drilling in the area. Um, core mining is in the area and actively drilling. And then there's a small block down to the southwest, um, which is owned by Waterton Resources, and they're drilling that. So the level of interest in the area has picked up substantially over the last two years. Um, our, our district setting is... Uh, again shown here with the, the blue outline, we think we see four trends of mineralization. Um, this, this block in the lower left corner, that red blotch, is the bullfrog deposit. Um, going up to the north of us is the north bullfrog area, and so we see a trend along there. Uh, there's another trend going off to the southwest from North Bullfrog, southeast from North Bullfrog. That looks like about a 10 to 11 million MA event. Um, to the south, there's a large east-west running fault called the Floresbar Canyon Fault, and that's a big controller of the mineralization along this range front to the south that connects to our mother load deposit. And then there's obviously another North trending system coming up from the far south, we east from a from a small mine called the Sterling Mine. Um, North Bullfrog is uh, a classic low sulfidation epithermal event. So, uh, if you can imagine, it's a it's a terrain of hot springs um, where the the fluids, the epithumal fluids, are reaching the conditions where they can boil, and when they boil, they deposit gold and quartz. Um, and then, and then the overlying tuffaceous rocks are porous, so they're conducting those vapors and producing big sheet-like deposits of low-grade gold. So our biggest deposit is here in the northwest corner of our property. That's about 11.6 MA. The, it's a pervasive alteration, uh, quartz agillaria. Um, it's oxidized to depths of around 200 meters, and the, the, the mineralization is low grade, but um, very leachable. So, so our two deposits, Sierra Blanca and this smaller, smaller deposit to the, to the southeast, Jolly Jane, are are, um, are associated with that event. Uh, su superposed on that in the, in the Sierra Blanca deposit is a, a steeply dipping quartz vein, vein stock work uh, system of much higher grade. We call that the yellow jacket. Um, and it's, it's a classic quartz vein, very much similar to the bullfrog vein uh, and that material is uh, free gold in the electrum, and it's 
uh, free milling. Um, it's very treatable. And then to the, to the south, you see this small, smaller um, deposit called Mayflower. That's another vein and structurally controlled uh, vein with um, an alteration disseminated halo around it. So it's a steeply dipping structure striking to the northwest. Uh, it mushrooms at the surface. So um, there, are, there are veins that are fairly high grade interspersed with a, a big disseminated halo of, um, of oxidized mineralization. So Sierra Blanca and Yellow Jacket are the two uh, big concentrations for us. And so I'll show you a picture of this. This is, this is fairly typical of the terrain. So you have on the west, you have a, a ridge of uh, welded tuff, which we call the Sierra Blanca unit. Um, and that's forming a dip slope off of that ridge back to the east. Um, at the base of the valley, you can see the you can see the drilling pads aligned um, along the base of the ridge, and that that's the drilling um, locations where we drilled this yellow jacket vein from. It was a little surprising in that most of the structures were dipping to the east, and the yellow jacket vein, of course, was dipping to the west. So all of our drilling was kind of oriented to test these, this dip slope, thick tuff coming off of the ridge and uh, was going parallel to the, to the dip of the yellow jacket vein. So I won't say it was luck, but um, it was pretty lucky that we actually hit it because most of our drilling w was not aligned to test it. Once we, once we hit it and realized what direction it was going, then it was easy to fill in along strike. So there's a cross section. So you see the ridge top uh, has a thick unit TSB. That's the Sierra Blanca tough. Um, it's dipping off of the ridge as it's, it's fairly much oxidized the full section and mineralized the full section. Below, as it gets deeper, as it comes down into the valley, you come through a um, a, re a redox boundary where the, where the mineralization, the disseminated mineralization is sulfide. And then you see cross-cutting it uh, to the east, the, the yellow jacket vein vein stockwork system. So that, that's a different pulse of mineralization. And as I said to you, it's, it's free gold and electrum there are concentrations of sulfide gold along that structure. And then there's a, um, a large fault that's east dipping that's also mineralized, but that mineralization tends to be sulfide mineralization. So our focus from the beginning has been, of course, the oxide and the free milling things. But that's, that's changing now because um, because we've added this mother load resource and the mother load has quite a bit of sulfide mineralization. So I'm just showing you here, a, this is a pit constrained um, map or volumetric profiling. So what you see is that orange, um, you see the orange yellow jacket structure along the east side of the deposit. And you see this yellow material is the disseminated low grade material. So, um, you know, our mining plans would be to dive down on that higher grade invade material and and what we would be stripping would be actually low grade heap leachable material in the hanging wall of the vein. Uh, so Bullfrog District, it's a epithermal system. We've, we've been working in there for about the last seven years. Um, and as we, as we work, we try to we try to de-risk some of the development access or aspects of the project. So we've acquired uh, 1,600 acre feet of water. It's, it's a desert, so water is a pretty com precious commodity down there. We're able to get a, a ranch that lies in a flat-lying basin that um, is in the northeast or the northwest corner of North Bullfrog. Um, and 
we recently drilled a water well out there that was uh, a big producer. So we're, we're confident that we have water right uh, where the facilities are going to be. Um, power, we, we, as we came into the area, the power company was building a new power line right through our property. So we, we worked with them to get the conductor sizes um, right for future development. Uh, Highway 95 you see is running right along the east boundary of the property. So we've got major access to the two uh, urban centers of Nevada and also those areas have the mine service support that somebody would need to develop a mine. And then Beatty, the town of Beatty was the source of the labor source for the bullfrog mine and um, I, they, they would like to have some of these high paying jobs that development could bring to the area. So we have, we work, we work on our, our relations with the community steadily. We have a 120 acre plan of operation for exploration. So we have the ability to put in another 100 or 600 holes. Um, we've been collecting baseline data on water quality and air quality, uh, acid drainage work has been done, cultural surveys. So we're, we've sort of tried to position the thing so that if an interested party comes along, they can see clearly how they're going to take it to, through to the stage of mining. Um, the mine will probably require an EA um, and then a full EIS to get a mining permit. Mother Load's a new system for us. It's to, to the south of our property, about five kilometers. Mother Load is a different thing. It's a sediment hosted deposit. Um, it had a small open pit that was operated in 1989, um, mining oxide material, um, mined down to about 100 meters of depth and scraped off this gray um, sulfide material at the bottom. So they stopped mining because they didn't have a processing system to deal with the sulfides. Um, we, we acquired the property in 2017 September of 2017, we started drill, drilling in earnest. Uh, we've outlined uh, a lower zone below the sulfide body, which is uh, looks like it's oxidized pretty extensively and will be amenable to heat leaching. And then the bulk of the mineralization is high grade intrusive dikes. And, it, and it's pretty clear that the dikes are the source of the mineralizing fluids for both the upper and the lower deposits. This is a photograph looking south. Um, and what you see there are the Bear Mountains. Um, this, this blue dash along the, the front range there is what we call the Florespan, Florespar Canyon Fault. So it's a fault that's outcropping along that surface and it's dipping about 45 degrees to the north so it's dipping out under the terrain. You see it's uh, highly mineralized along the fault, but uh, the mineralization doesn't extend outside the region of the fault very much. And as it comes over towards the mother load deposit, it's intercepted by this, this uh, north, north striking structure. So it actually bends and strikes north across the deposit. Um, the yellow, area you see is what is the area that we're we're currently drilling we have a we have a notice level drilling permit um, and we've cleverly got 105 holes drilled in that notice area we're working on an ea right now to expand the drilling footprint um, we pretty we pretty much think we've identified the the feeder for the mineralization is to the west and at depth um, and then the, the, the area is open to the north. Um, so we, have, we think we have good prospects to extend the deposit farther as we get more access for drilling. Here's a, here's a cross section that shows you sort of an exploration model. So you see here at depth in the west, um, what we call it the deep mother load target is actually what we think the source of the fluids is and it's and it's coming up along a unconformity 
and along that unconformity, dikes are being injected, um, coming up dip, and then a, and then you get to the top. It's a tabular body. It can be typically 75 meters thick, and that 75 meters could have an average grade of one and a half to two grams. Um, those red, the red lines show you in the drilling data where the half a gram ton um, zone is. We, we think that there are other dikes coming up from below uh, based on intercepts that we have at depth and deposit. So we think there's a good chance that we can expand the resource in the vertical direction as well as to the north. Two? Okay. Great. Um, sulfide metallurgical work is important and we've, we've got some scoping work going on um, the, gold, the gold occurs as very fine, discrete grains. We have about, um, it looks 10 to 20% of the gold will report to gravity. Then we would have, we think we would have a flotation circuit. Um, and then we looked, we've looked at all, virtually all of the oxidation techniques on a, on a scoping level. Um, we've got a production layout that joins the two deposits into an integrated project. Um, that would have a central mill located at Mother Load. Both Mother Load and North Bullfrog would have big heap leaches in addition. Um, both sites have power and both sites have water, so we're, we're, in a, we're positioned well for an aggressive uh, major to come in and take the project forward. Uh, this, is the, this is the resource statement. Um, the important number is that um, we, it looks like we have about a million and a half ounces of gold for milling circuits. That would be both oxide and sulfide. And then another million and a half ounces of heat leachable gold um, in the measured and indicated category, another half million that would be indicated. So it's a total resource of in the range of three million ounces, uh, which would be substantial. Is that me? Okay. I'm. I've run out of time, and I also finished. So <laughs> thanks for your attention. I appreciate it. Our next speaker is Melanie Newton. Ms. Newton has over three years' experience as a geologist on the Carlin trend in northern Nevada at the Railroad Pinion property. Ms. Newton contributed to the development of dark star and pinion sediment hosted gold deposits and jasperite wash sediment hosted gold target. She contributed to the expansion of the North Bullion, Sweet Hollow, and Pod sediment hosted gold deposits as well. Uh, Ms. Newton graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor of Science degree in geology from Western Kentucky University and a Master of Science degree in Geology from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where she completed her thesis on characterization of gold and related mineralization at the North Bullion Fault Zone Railroad Project, a Nevada Carlin type gold prospect. And she's here to tell us about her project today. Take it away, Melanie. Good afternoon. My name is Melanie Newton and I'm with Gold Standard Ventures and today's talk will be on the geology of the Dark Star deposit that exhibits Carlin style mineralization on the Railroad Pinion project uh, just south on the Carlin Trend. Uh, GSV is a Canadian junior and so we are required to show some forward looking statements. GSV controls 208 square kilometers on the Carlin Trend, which makes us the second largest landowners on the Carlin Trend. Um, our technical team has experience exploring for Carlin types uh, gold mineralization on the Carlin Trend and operating these mines, and we're able to use that knowledge and experience on our own property. Uh, we currently have three NI43-101 compliant resources on the property and a target-rich exploration environment. 
Our major corporate investors allow us to continue funding our exploration and drilling programs, uh, and we're going to continue to be doing this in 2019. So Nevada is home to a world-class mining uh, jurisdiction. It has numerous plus 20 million ounce deposits. Uh, it has a pro-mining environment with major infrastructure and over 22 processing facilities. So it makes an exciting place to be exploring for gold mineralization uh, in the states. GSV has two properties, the railroad and Lewis projects indicated by the red stars. The railroad property, which is home to the Dark Star deposit, is just south of the rain and immigrant mine on the Carlin Trend, um, indicated right there. The Carlin Trend is the most prolific gold mining belt in the Western Hemisphere. It has more than 70 kilometers in strike length with more than 200 million ounces uh, gold endowment. It started in the 1960s with the founding of the Carlin Mine, and through systematic exploration, it has yielded more and more ounces. The train consists of four domes or windows, the Richmond Dome, the Maggie Creek Dome, the Rain Dome, and the Railroad Dome. And this is where these deposits uh, on the Carlin Trend are focal uh, points around these domes because they've been uplifted and are closer to surface, and these where the, these operations are. The GSV technical team has significant or have been significant contributors to the discoveries and operations with Newmont. Um, some of the mines listed here are, are, is their resume, as you will. Uh, the green outline is the railroad pinion project to the south, and that's the Dark Star pause deposit right there. One of GSV's strengths is that we've been able to capitalize on, on market downturns and make strategic acquisitions through the year. So starting with the property outline in 2010 and our current property uh, outline in 2019. So we've been able to consolidate 200 and 208 square kilometers that has not been previously consolidated nor systematically explored before. Previous companies had had pieces or parts of the story and through this consolidation, we've been able to identify district scale trends on the property. With the black line represented the property boundary, uh, Newmont's rain and immigrant mine just to the north of the property. The blue lines are the major structures on the property. This red polygon is the Bald Mountain stock. And you can see that dominantly these structures are in a north-south striking uh, orientation, cross-cut by northwest and northeast structures uh, surrounded in igneous intrusion. That's often a, a theme for Carlin-type gold deposits. The GT shapes show the, the, gold end, the known gold endowment for the property, and the gray hatching shows other exploration areas that we consider on the property. We've been able to identify three major structural corridors on the property, the Dark Star Structural Corridor, the North Bullion Pinion Corridor, and the Ski Track Corridor. North Bullion and Pinion show similar geology to the rain and immigrant district. The Dark Star, Jasperoid Wash, and Dixie deposits have been found in what would be considered new carbonate host rocks for the Carlin Trend, which are Pennsylvanian, Permian, and Age. A total of 3.6 million ounces has been identified in NI4-3-101 compliant resources. That includes the Dark Star and Pinion shallow oxide gold resources, the North Bullion Deposit, which is a high-grade sulfide gold resource. In addition, multiple early stage discoveries, such as the Dixie Target and the West, uh, the Jasper Wash Target, and multiple untested targets, like the Ski Track area and the LT area. We ran seismic um, on the southern end of the property, indicated by this purple line. And what we see is that each of our structural corridors are cored by these subsurface anaclines, and that our gold deposits, pinion and dark star, correlate with near surface structural disruption at the apex of these folds. And that's another Carlin theme. And we see a similar pattern at our untested target for ski track. 
Each of these structural corridors are prospective dike-filled faulted corridors developed along these broken anaclinal axes. And with the identif identification of Pennsylvanian Permian rocks as a new mineralizing horizon for Carlin-style mineralization, it's presented new target opportunities on the property and for the Carlin trend. This is a generalized section for the property. Uh, this is the alteration column with pink being silicification, yellow being decalcification, and blue doing, being dole optimization. Uh, the gold here in, represented in red shows us the mineralizing horizons in our stratigraphic section. Starting with the oldest, the Devonian oxyoak formation is a calcareous sandstone. Above that is the Devonian Sentinel Mount Dolomite, which is the host rock for our Sentinel Breccia, which is just north of the Pinion deposit. Above that is the Devonian Devil's Gate Limestone. It's dominantly calcarinite, but can be interbedded with micrite. At the Mississippian Devonian contact, we often see the multilithic dissolution collapse breccia that has class of your Devonian carbonates and your Mississippian silty micrite and siliciclastic rocks. This is a productive host horizon in the rain and immigrant district, and it's a productive host horizon for us here on the property at both Pinion and North Bullion. Uh, above that is the Mississippian Tripon Pass Formation, which is a silty micrite, and then we continue into our Mississippian Flish assemblage which, assemblage, which includes the Mississippian Web, which is dominantly a mudstone, the Mississippian Chainman, uh, dominantly a sandstone. This can also be a mineralizing, mineralizing horizon, uh, both at Pinion and Dark Star. It seems to be dominantly structurally related. On to the Mississippian Tonka Formation, which is dominantly a conglomerate uh, with sandstones and mudstones. We do see on the western portion of the property where the Devonian Woodruff Formation, which is a siliceous mudstone, has been thrusted up over the Mississippian Chainman Unit. Above the Tonka is the Pennsylvanian Permian Carbonate Host Rocks. These were formed in a shallow marine shelf. Uh, we currently use informal unit names. Uh, this includes the lower silty limestone unit, which is dominantly a silty calc siltite, can in be interbedded with calcarinite and micrite. Above that is the middle conglomerate unit, which is a debris flow conglomerate. We do see turbidite sequences or, or bauma sequences. Uh, it can be interbedded with sandy calcarinites or bioclastic limestones. Above that is the upper silty limestone unit, and it's very similar in characteristics as the lower silty limestone unit. The middle conglomerate is the main productive host horizon for our Dark Star, Jasperoid Wash, and Dixie deposits. Above that is the tertiary Elko formation, which is a conglomerate sandstone and mudstone. It can have some limestone beds. It was a lacustrian environment. And we've recently identified this as a new host horizon for Dark Star and Jasperoid Wash. Above that is the tertiary Indian well ash flow tuff. So focusing on the Dark Star deposit, uh, the middle conglomerate being the main host horizon, these 16 samples came from DC 1807, which was cored at the heart of North Dark Star. It had 230 meters of about two grams uh, 14 meters from surface. You can see uh, you have carbonate classed within a carbonate matrix, and the matrix can vary from calcarinite being our most coarse grain and up to having a micrate ma matrix. As I mentioned before, the years, the years these um, finding upward turbidite sequences. These rocks have a decalcification of three, so there's no carbonate material left in, in the rocks. They've been variably silicified, clay altered, and oxidized with limatite and hematite. We do see some samples that have jericite or scoridite on fractures, and often this correlates with some higher grades. It seems like most of the mineralization seems to be strongly correlated with porosity, and whether that's the characteristics of the host rock itself, like a calcarinite uh, interbedded between two micrate beds, you'll see some high grades related to that, or structure related because it's adjacent to a fault and you've increased fraction or brecciation. 
So the Dark Star Corridor is currently estimated to be 12 kilometers in strike length. Uh, the Pennsylvania and Permian rocks are the light blue rocks we see here uh, hosted for our Dark Star and Dixie deposits. Uh, it's a horse structure bounded on the east side by the Dark Star Fault, which has downdropped our favorable host unit deep within the basin. And then it's bounded on the west side by the West Fault. It's a reactivated thrust, which emplaced Mississippian chainmen on uh, Pennsylvanian Permian rocks. And you can see the structural corridor is dominantly striking north-south, cross-cut by northwest and northeast structures. So focusing on the Dark Star corridor, this horse structure bounded by the Dark Star and the West Fault, there's a series of north-south striking faults within this corridor, one being the Ridge Line, the IDK Fault, and the East Fault. These are north-south striking faults that down drop to the east, and they're cross-cut by a series of northwest structures, the Saddle Fault and the Outcrop Fault, that are northwest striking structures that down drop to the north. Uh, the West Dark Star is actually hosted along the West Fault and with the Mississippian Chainman. It's deeper sulfide and it currently remains to be an exploration target. Dark Star deposit is a near surface high grade oxide gold deposit. You see mineralization at surface both at Maine and North Dark Star with the potential of a structurally controlled high grade sulfide at depth at both North and West Dark Star. It's 1.3 kilometers in strike. Um, currently, we started our infill or development program in 2017, where we were able to build our 2017 resource. And in 2018, we ramped up the program and started doing our infill drilling, uh, sort of defining out both North and Main Dark Star. And we're going to continue doing that in 2019. Focusing on North Dark Star. We started to see in our 2018 drill pattern that we had several holes indicated in red uh, that were bottoming in oxide, high-grade oxide mineralization below the existing resource model. And so our phase two and phase three drilling was to come back and do some deeper tests and see that the mineralization was continuing up to 100 meters below the existing resource, uh, still dominantly oxide, but with some sulfide. The prior school of thought was that the ridgeline was a hard boundary and we hadn't modeled mineralization footwall to that ridgeline fault. And so the blue polygon shows um, holes that we were seeing mineralization footwall to that structure. And so we were able to do some more infill drilling in phase two and three and define the mineralization to the west. The pink dots represent our 2019 planned holes, so we're going to continue doing infill drilling to the north, the west, and to the south. Before I move on, the blue lines are our sections that we're going to be stepping through uh, the North Dark Star deposit. Uh, where we'll be looking north and starting with section A. So the high grade is represented by the hotter colors, the low grade represented by the cooler colors. The black line is the 2018 pit outline. It was done midway through last year's infill program. This is the top of the debris flow conglomerate and then the bottom of the debris flow conglomerate, this being our favorable uh, host unit. The red line is our 0.1 GT shape and then you have the ridge line, the IDK and East Fault uh, indicated there. And what we saw is that the, in our phase one 2018 drilling, we had holes uh, TDing and mineralization below the resource, and we were doing these deeper tests like DC 1822 to try to get out past it. As we bench north, you can see this pink polygon here is showing the potential pit expansion uh, that we were able to see mineralization up to 100 meters below the resource model and seeing that mineralization was indeed extending foot wall to the ridgeline fault. A similar pattern, you can see our ore body seems to be diving to the north about 20 degrees. Um, we can see that permissive host rocks and favorable alteration continue approximately 100 meters below the resource model. Much of this zone is oxide with some sulfide portions. 
uh, this deeper mineralization, um, whereas before we thought a lot of Dark Star was stratigraphically controlled, we can see that there is a structural control definitely at North Dark Star between the Ridgeline and IDK Fault, where this mineralization is, is uh, deeper and remains open at depth and with the identification of hydrothermal breaches. Uh, this sample here is from North Dark Star. Uh, it shows hydrothermal breccias, and you can see how the texture correlates with hydrothermal breccias found at other Carlin-type gold deposits in northern Nevada. This is a cross-section through main Dark Star. You can see that mineralization is outcropping at surface. It seems to be dominantly stratigraphically controlled, and we do see mineralization foot wall to the ridgeline fault. So in summary from our 2018 drilling, we can see that North Dark Star remains open to the north, the west, and at depth, that main south into the west, and that the connection between north and main is more continuous than we originally modeled. And so we'll be doing some more infill drilling in that area as well. The deposit footprint expanded outward from our 2017 resource, and our infill drilling goal is to reach a 90 to 95% measured and indicated for the economic studies we have currently in progress. We've done some testing both in bottle rolls and column tests, and we can see that running um, the test or bottle rolls test through a 10 and 200 mesh that we get an average gold recovery of 88 to 91%. Uh, the column test, we ran oxide and transitional material at a P80, and the oxide material averaged 86.5 recovery and transitional at 70% recoveries. And from this, we can see that Dark Star is a high-grade leach extraction and will support a simple heat leach processing, whether it's crushed or run a mine, and lime consumption is low while cyanide consumption is within a normal range. Uh, significant news flow for 2019. We'll be releasing any of the, the data we'll be doing for our infill and expiration drilling uh, for the year on multiple targets. We're hoping to release our Dark Star and Pinion resource updates that's in support of economic studies we have currently in progress. We'd like to release the Jasper Aid Wash Maiden resource estimate and then obviously keep tuned to any new discoveries we might be making. Thank you. Interesting. We have tertiary volcanic sediments hosting jasperoids on the Carlin trend. I expect a very lively debate and discussion at 4.30. Very good, Melanie. Thanks a lot. Um, our next presenter is Jake Margolis from Canarc Resources. Um, Jake received his master's degree from the University of Washington, working on the gold deposits of the Wenatchee District. He completed his PhD at the University of Oregon, studying the copper gold deposits of the Sulphurets District in British Columbia. Jake has 28 years of professional experience, having principally worked for Homestake, Anglo Gold, and Red Star Gold Corporation. He is currently Vice President of Exploration for Canark Resources. Thanks, Jake. Oh, can you get the presentation? Do you want me to do that one again? Okay. Just wing it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's just jump right in here. I have backward-looking statements, and the lawyers haven't figured that one out yet, so I don't know the slide. Um, so uh, Finaway Canyon is about 60 kilometers northeast of Fallon, and the deposits in this region are mostly to the north. This is a variety of, of occurrences and in, in significant deposits, gold and gold-silver. Uh, some are very young, like Florida Canyon. Some are more Mesozoic in age. Um, we'll see later that, that Fondaway is probably most similar to Relief Canyon in terms of the age of mineralization and, pot, and, and certainly the host rocks. Uh, we're uh, on the west flank of the Stillwater Range here. Uh, tungsten was discovered in the 50s. There was some uh, uh, production following that. 
the family that owned the claims uh, began production of, uh, they found gold in the 70s and began production uh, small scale. And then we had a parade of exploration companies in the 80s culminating with Tenneco, who did most of the drilling in the district. They operated a small open pit um, heap leach uh, operation for about one year, recovering a small amount of gold. The oxidation levels here are very shallow, and that was the one issue they ran into there. They drove a decline into some high-grade sulfide, uh, which they stockpiled but didn't do any recovery on. Uh, we then had Nevada Contact come in in 2002 with a small drilling program. And since the spring of 17, we've been involved, um, probably doing the most comprehensive work in the district. Uh, just before Canark arrived here in early 17, there was an uh, indicated and inferred resource of just over a million ounces at six grams. That was focused on underground uh, potential. The geology here is mostly, the district's mostly underlain by Triassic shale and siltstone. You see in the light green, which is dipping to the southwest. Uh, lots of internal folding here. Within that are some um, tough horizons. These had been misinterpreted as dikes previously, but they're tufts. Um, and they're important marker units in recognizing faults. There's some quartzite here in the eastern part of the area. And then we have a thrust a regional thrust here that comes into the district, placing quartzite and limestone in the upper plate. The limestone is mostly marble. Um, the, mar the limestone occurs as discontinuous thrust slices. And these, these, this thrust has been folded. It, it's often, um, it's commonly overturned and very steepened. Um, the marble, the development of the marble could have been a regional effect, but it, it looks more likely that it was related to the intrusion of this um, late Oligocene granite. This, this is a recent uranium lead zircon age by the USGS that's just come out. Um, and then the crest of the Stillwater Range and then to the east we have an east dipping, gently east dipping section of Oligocene volcanics um, which, are, which could have been fed by the magmatism here. So the range is tilted to the east and so we're looking at deeper levels here where we have the intrusive body and volcanics. And then um, we have some high angle faults in the dark green. Most importantly, is a series, there's a dike swarm through the district. In dark purple and the light purple are mafic or basaltic andesite dikes. These are coincident with mineralization at the district scale. They're locally altered and mineralized. And we've obtained um, dates of 25 uh, million on, on those where they're less altered. Um, and so that's. Um, my guess is that's around the time of mineralization, and we'll see more evidence of that as we go farther. Uh, we also have some, uh, it, near the range front here, uh, some more dacitic dikes. These have rare quartz phenacris. They're silicified, and they're cut by, they're weakly mineralized. They're cut by the uh, mafic dikes. They're probably earlier. And then we have a set of, in brown, uh, more north striking, northwest striking dikes and sills again, that are mafic. Uh, these we've recently dated as middle Miocene at 16. These are post-mineral, um, and they're concentrated near the range front. So the, the ones that are, that, that are coincident with mineralization look like this, a couple meter wide dike here in black, uh, steeply dipping shale. These get a little bit altered, and uh, you can see the arsenic and a little bit of gold. Um, these irregular margins probably due to the a low viscosity on these things. And locally, these are strongly mineralized. Here's a four gram sample with high arsenic in, in the same dike uh, along strike. These have coarse plagioclase phenocris, uh, which is one of the reasons we were able to date this. Uh, here's a thin section there. So the, the, the mineralization occurs uh, in a series of, of shear zones, is really the best description, which I've shown here in red, um, that are exposed across more than three kilometers. And if we look, and these are generally west-northwest striking zones, and if we look at a footprint of, of two grams or better based on surface sampling and, and drilling, uh, that's what these blobs are. Uh, and you can see, again, there, there's a fair bit of west-northwest fabric here. There is a little bit of mineralization that was found um, under shallow cover in the pediment west of the range front fault. Um, however, this is a little less than two grams, so I'm not showing it here. But the mineralization is apparently downdropped. We haven't done uh, any recent drilling there. That this was discovered in, in 2002. 
The, the pits from the 1980s and, and also Tenneco are shown in black. They did most of their uh, uh, short program here at what's called South Mouth. They also drove a tunnel into high grade sulfide uh, in the central part of the district. Now, now that I know the age of the dikes, um, it's become apparent that we can now relate this broader mineralized system at 25 million, which is the likely age for it, with um, what's going on with this siliceous granite. It produced a broad contact metamorphic environment, mostly hornfells and quartzite, um, but also small scarn zones, which have some massive magnetite shown in black. These um, do contain low-grade gold. I had one sample of magnetite that ran 600 PBB. There's a little bit of paulite, that's a, a molybdenum mineral. And then we get, um, in the marble, more distal, we get disseminated sheolite. And this is what the original discovery was in the district. Here's an example from underground with a black light of some of that disseminated sheolite. There's also some contact metamorphism down here near South Mouth around those dacitic dikes. And I suspect those dikes might be a comagmatic with the granite farther north. So at first glance, it appears that we have a contact environment. Um, there's, oh, and I want to mention there's very little gold in, in this contact environment or in place at that time. Um, at broader scale, then, we have our large gold system outboard of that. The one place we have found some, some gold in the, in the scarring is right here near the range front at a place called the Reed Pit. Uh, this is a sample I took from a stockpile, uh, very high grade, 42 ppm. The gold apparently occurs in these siliceous jaspery type spiderweb veinlets in this marble. So this is probably a retrograde facies on the scarn. Uh, we don't really know this. We don't know a lot about this because it's very poorly exposed and we haven't drilled it. There was some very shallow drilling, uh, but it hasn't, we, we don't really understand this at this point. So the main gold system I'm loosely terming mesothermal. It consists of quartz iron carbonate sulfide veins that are very diffuse. They occur in steep and low angle shear zones. We have disseminated gold also in sulfidized bleach shale. Uh, the sulfides are mostly pyrite and arsenopyrite, which is very fine grained. We have some late stibnite and some minor base metal sulfides. But the overall copper lead zinc concentrations are very low. We rarely get anything over 100 ppm. The silver to gold ratio is less than one and mercury contents are, are largely less than one ppm. Gold, gold carlate strongest with arsenic. Um, and I mentioned the, 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 the broad size of this, but also we have a, a good vertical range of, of close to 700 meters of high grade mineralization without any significant changes in mineralogy or the, the, the nature of the mineralization. And we're subvolcanic. So if this was 25 ish, we're below the volcanics at that time. The uh, shear zone mineralization looks like this there are these crushed zones. Uh, here, a two meter sample around 20 ppm. In this case, it's oxidized. Um, I'm not sure why Tenneco didn't mine this material, um, but a lot of crushing and shear fabric. Another example near one of these altered, uh, weakly altered mafic dikes with, with bleaching and iron oxide development in the shale and a little bit of shearing here along a structure. This one was three meters of a little over two ppm. Notice the very high arsenic and the low silver numbers. We get mineralization in low angle fabrics as well that were probably thrust faults. You can see this lenticular imbricated type fabric here. And this, this sample ran, uh, again, very high grade, 24 grams over two meters. In, in more detail, the, again, these are diffuse zones. Here you see almost a replacement style texture where the arsenopyrite, which is the gray material here, is, is, is sort of replacing the siltstone or shale. On the right is, is the third hole uh, of our seven hole program from 2017. Uh, 2.8 ppm over 65 meters. And if you look at the gold contents, you'll see that it, there's a lot of gold without quartz veining that's occurring in um, bleach shale with disseminated sulfide. The correlation with quartz veins, although uh, looks apparent here, you have 14 grams and 17 grams, this, the quartz veins are, um, are, are not generally uh, correlated with gold. So the tunnel that Tenneco drill, the drove I mentioned, they, they drifted for about 100 feet, about 100 feet below surface. The easternmost uh, face of that drift looks like this, about a half an ounce over 11 feet. And this material was stockpiled, so I collected several representative types from this. Uh, on the right, uh, carbonaceous siltstone with disseminated sulfide, 
very high arsenic. Uh, you can see the high-grade gold there at 11 grams. Uh, still very low silver. With the, court, with, with the more quartz veining in, in this type of material, we get still some good gold, uh, 21 grams, uh, but we pick up the anemone and some unusually high zinc, which is not very typical of the district overall. And on the left, this is the stibnite in the, in the uh, gray metallic here with these um, quartz veins. Again, good gold, but of course, a lot of stibnite and, and uh, lower arsenic. Disseminated mineralization at this time occurs in a broad halo around these shear zones, and we get, uh, here you see the iron oxide in bleaching in a siltstone that's steeply dipping. These calcite veinlets are barren. Um, some of the siltstone in the district is calcareous, uh, but it's not very common. Here we have five feet of, of two and a half gram, 2.4 grams. And on the right, another bleached uh, shear zone environment with no quartz veining, just disseminated um, mineralization in the siltstone. Again, 10 grams over three meters in that case. In the eastern part of the district, the mineralization occurs in quartzite as well, and, and here disseminated uh, sulfidized quartzite without quartz veins, again, three meters of 5.7 grams. So a few years ago, there was a study done uh, showing that gold occurs under the microscope. It's visible, so this is not like Carlin atomic substitution, arsenium pyrite type gold. This is particular gold uh, along grain boundaries with pyrite and arsenopyrite. Uh, you see here on the lower right some stibnite and calcopyrite with the gold, but um, all indications are that the stibnite anyway is, is later. So on a fractal basis, we see quartz veins that are barren or low, very low grade uh, cutting the uh, higher grade mineralization, which, which would be in these grayer zones. And, and this is uh, barren quartz veining. This is from one of the 2002 drill holes. And when you go in the field and you sample this type of, of zone, you find the quartz veins have very little gold. The wall rock with the, um, with, with the bleaching, and, and uh, in this case, it's oxidized, but, but six grams here. So what we have then is this, is this later quartz veining event, which I'm loosely calling epithermal, um, which is concentrated along northeast structures, uh, which are, by all indications, normal faults. These veins have sharp walls. They, they have vein breaches within them. They're very brittle. They have open space coxcomb quartz. Uh, and there's some sti stibnite, cinnabar, and silver coming in at this time. But we're not seeing the really shallow indicators that we would typically find if we were uh, much closer to the paleo surface. These veins look like this on the right. I think that's a sample bag. Uh, th these are um, some of these uh, sharp walled quartz veins. Uh, and you can see a low grade value here, uh, a close up with the sharp wall and the breccia fabric, some open space with the quartz crystals, and on the left, a similar situation. Here, a little bit better gold, but notice the mercury is much higher than we typically see, and also the silver is kicking a little bit. So if we stand back and look at the district, what it looks like is we have these west-northwest fabrics with the mineralization apparently offset uh, to the south as we go to the west. So I developed a structural or more kinematic model for this in which we have a sinistral shear zone system, uh, which began to become dilatant with time as gold was emplaced. Um, as this opened, we get these linkage faults with their ex which are extensional, and these are the site where we get these late quartz veins emplaced with the extensional uh, fabrics. The, the strongest mineralization occurs at the corners of this dilation environment. Uh, our hole three was up in this corner. Uh, the Tenneco's tunnel was over here. We drilled one of our holes here. We had a pretty good intersection of, of 13 meters of three and a half grams at the southeast corner. This, this trend of the system has been far less explored than, than the northern one. If we look at a cross section looking southeast across here along that pack rat fault system, which is the <clears throat> sort of northeast linkage structural zone, it looks like this. This is 100 meters. Uh, Green is 250 PBB and, and one gram or better in red. Several of our holes are shown in here, our second and third holes over here, and, and our hole one showing some, just highlighting some of the intersections. The, the northwest corner of the dilation zone with a corridor of, of mineralization plunging to the south. And then the southwest corner of the zone, which has seen far less exploration and drilling, um, that, that drilling from way back in the late 80s. So uh, 
what, what went on here apparently was the emplacement of this, this late oligocene stock, uh, possibly these dacitic dikes, the contact metamorphic environment, uh, which, which has in particular tungsten, moly, and boron with it. Uh, volcanics up there somewhere in the air, uh, which are now exposed on the east side of the range, and, and our magnetites in place at this time. We then get the uh, mafic dikes coming in, probably feeding the oligocene volcanics as well, and the, develop, the, the start of our gold arsenic shear zone system, which became more dilatant with time, and we get these extensional uh, late stage quartz veins as the system waned. And the signature here is more um, antimony, mercury, and silver. And then we have a break and we get our uh, middle Miocene uh, dikes. So uh, in terms of Relief Canyon, uh, what's interesting here is that there are two ages that have been proposed for mineralization there. There's evidence of gold being emplaced at around 23 to 24 million, and there's evidence of gold being emplaced at 15. And we have the same two magmatic events here. Um, there are also mafic dikes at Relief Canyon that they've been unable to date uh, at this point. Um, it's possible that we have some mineralization of this age in, in the district at Fond du but we haven't seen any um, obvious evidence for that. So I think with that, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. We actually have a few minutes for questions, if anybody has anything. Um, actually, I don't know, but I, had, I have some samples of, of little sulfitic gossins associated with the scarns that, that have very high boron. And there's one little occurrence of demordiorite in the quartzite in, in near the granite stock. So I'm, I'm definitely seeing a boron kick in that, but uh, I haven't seen any visual tourmaline. I'm not actually sure it could be tourmaline. I'm not sure what it is. Just goes to show you need some structural preparation and a fluid source and anything can become a gold deposit, right? Even black shale. Our next speaker is Clay Newton and he's gonna talk to us about kind of the overall tectonic picture of the Gray Basin. Clay is an exploration geologist in Nevada, president of the geological consulting firm Tectonics LLC, and vice president of exploration of Fremont Gold Limited. He earned a PhD degree in economic geology and tectonics from the University of Arizona. Come on up, Clay. Tell me when my time is halfway through. Okay. Thank you. There's no forward looking statement. I'm not publicly traded and I'm not selling anything. Are we all set? Uh, what I am going to talk about and hopefully have enough time to get through all of it is my interpretation of the tectonic evolution of the Great Basin and some inferences about the relationship of those tectonics to ore deposits. Um, the Great Basin is outlined in black here and it, it's, it's a, a structure that is quite interesting in that uh, it actually has internal drainage. And this was first recognized in 1843 by John C. Fremont. He got over to the Carson River and he was looking to get through the Sierras and he looked up and realized there was no river going through the Sierras. And so he decided that everything he had just come through was a basin and he was correct. It was actually a pretty cogent. Uh, it, it does have internal drainage. There's a reason for that. And the reason is that it is essentially a basin, and it was created by uh, the development of nested pull-apart basins in different times and in different spaces. 
What I want you to, to see in this figure right here is that typographically, there are, in, in this case, two major orientations of structures. One is northeast, particularly in this zone right here. And the other dominant trend is essentially north-south. There are some northwest trends, particularly when you get over into the Walker Lane. Uh, but for the older part of the basin, uh, it's dominantly northeast and north-south. I'll, I'll point out this feature right here, this sinusoidal ridge system. This is the Ruby Mountains metamorphic core complex. Uh, and this is the Grant Range, which has also been interpreted as a metamorphic core complex. This is the central part of the Great Basin. And my, my thesis here is that the Great Basin itself is primarily one big sinistral pull-apart basin. Now, that northeast trend has some analogs elsewhere in the northwest U.S. This is uh, in Idaho and Montana. It's, it's the Great Falls Lineament or the Great Falls Tectonic Zone, and it has that same northeast orientation. It actually is a boundary between two cratonic blocks. It's, it's a, a deep crustal lithospheric boundary. So this image of the Great Basin uh, is also a digital elevation model, uh, but it, it's colored so that it shows different elevation levels. Uh, the green is, whoops. The green are the, the lowest elevations as the Great Valley. The highest elevations look like snow-capped peaks. They're, they're bluish gray and, and, and white in the highest elevations. And then the rest of it is, is are shades of brown. Now what you can see is that on the east and the west side of the Great Basin, there are two typographically low features relative to the ranges around them. And you can also see the rhomboid shape of these features. These are relatively young pull-apart basins. Um, and they actually were filled with lakes in, in post-glacial time. Uh, you, can, you can see uh, multiple terraces uh, in, in both of these. This one is the Bonneville Basin. This one I call the Lahontan Basin. Uh, the other thing that you can see in addition to the terraces cut into the walls are that at least in the Lahontan Basin, it's filled with flat-lying or gently dipping felsic volcanic rocks, primarily tufts. Uh, and that's something I'm gonna get back to later on. All right, the, the feature that I showed you here is the central part of the basin. It's the oldest part of the basin. It's where the Carlin deposits are. Uh, essentially, this is, this is a hen zone and it essentially stays put while the rest of the basin develops around it. So this is the oldest portion. The edges of it are the youngest portion. This is a model showing both a sinistral pull-apart basin and a dextral pull-apart basin, a sinistral at the top. And the difference between the two really is a slight difference in orientation of the maximum principal stress direction, the sigma one orientation. If it's, if it's pointed slightly to the east or slightly to the west, you're gonna wind up with dominantly dextral shear. If it's located slightly to the east of north, you're gonna wind up with dominantly sinistral shear. It turns out that the, the dominant sense of shear producing the Great Basin was sinistral. It's actually different. I started working on this 25 years ago for Kennecott, and we started thinking, well, okay, this is, this is dextral strike slip faulting. Well, we were wrong. A lot of it is, and a lot of that dextral faulting is important, but the, the bulk of it was actually sinistral. All right, so here is an example of a hen zone. You can see that it's sinusoidal, um, and the, the basin develops by movement along these bounding faults. In the sinistral case, you're gonna have to see an extension to the northeast and an extension to the south west. 
In the, in, the, in the dextral case, you'll see an extension to the northwest and an extension to the southeast. The basin essentially opens, uh, in, the, in this case, it's opening in a, a west-northwest, east-southeast direction. Um, but it's opening by transtension. Now, cumulatively, in the Great Basin, we're going to see that it produced a lot of what can be called extension. You could also make the case that there's been no extension in the Great Basin, that it's all transtension. All right, so let's pick out some of these features. The Ruby Mountains Grant Range is a metamorphic core complex. Uh, the Grant Range is an amphibolite grade complex. This is a manifestation of a hen zone. This is where you had, within the Great Basin, the most extension. Uh, and so, essentially, again, it's the oldest part, although the extension was, was episodic throughout the life of, of the, the Great Basin. And, and the, the highest rate of extension was actually about 17 or 18 million years ago, even though the feature started in Eocene time. All right, I have outlined in red some of the faults that I've picked out that have that northeast trend. You can, you can see here also, I have put in faults that outline this rhomboid shape to the Bonneville Basin. Uh, it has, it has a, a, a trailing fault out to the northeast. It has another trailing fault that goes out to the coast. And it essentially is defining, these two zones together are defining uh, a left lateral pull apart zone. All right, now, these northeast features, we would expect, okay, if, if, if these are, are left lateral strike slip faults, and, and that's something that, that I should stop and emphasize here, in the diagrams that I showed, there were three different directions of, of faults. The northeast faults are gonna be left lateral strike slip faults. They're also gonna have some dip slip component because they're forming basins. The northwest trending faults are right lateral strike slip faults, also with some dip slip. And the hen zones, which are basically north-south, are controlled by normal faults. So north-south is your normal fault trend. And it's the interaction of these three fault trends that controlled hydrothermal and magmatic activity in the Great Basin. So can we see evidence uh, that these are actually fairly major left lateral strike slip faults? Well, here's, here's an example I think actually does demonstrate that. This is the, in green I'm showing the Looning Fencemaker Fault System. Uh, it becomes the, the Black Rock Fault System up here. But I think there's a good case to be made that it, there actually is left lateral offset along this fault that goes past Florida Canyon. Florida Canyon would be about right in there. Um, so, and, th and then also uh, further over to the northeast, there are some Paleozoic stratigraphic units that are offset as well. So I think there's a good case to be made that these are, are fairly substantial crust and scale structures. Now, how do they form? What are they related to? They're related to the convergence of the Farallon plate with the North American plate. And this is, this is the scenario that was going on from about 80 million years to 40 million years ago. There was flat subduction, and uh, the, the edge of the subducted slab went all the way over into Colorado. It created the Rocky Mountains. That ended about 40 million years ago. Uh, subsequently, the, the, plate, the subducted slab started to cool, it started to subside, and it started to retreat, but it didn't quit subducting. And that's one of the things that, that some people have incorrectly said. Subduction did not cease at the end of the Laramide orogeny. It just changed. Uh, and we can see that in the Great Basin because there are andesites all the way up until seven million years ago. They just shifted position as, as the magmatic front shifted position. 
okay, this is going to be tough. <laughs> um, all right, so this, this shows the convergence vectors between the Farallon plate and the North American plate. You can see that they're oriented northeast. And I have put those onto the image that shows the structures that I have picked out. So you can see that that, <clears throat> that convergence vector uh, is pretty similar to the orientation of those northeast trends. And as I said, the magmatic front f after 40 million years, this, this has been well documented, uh, shifted from northeast Nevada to the southwest. So this is a nice acron of, of igneous rocks that are 40 million years old, 30 million years old, 20 million years old. There was a basin up here this in Eocene time. Uh, it's, it's, there's the Carlin formation, the Elko formation. These are, are uh, subaqueous formations. Another thing that's been stated uh, is that essentially basin and range extension, as it's called, didn't even start until maybe 18 million years ago. It used to be 10 million years ago. That all of the basin and range formed 10 million years ago. That's a complete fallacy. This, these basins and ranges were forming as early as Eocene time. All right, so in, in this picture here, we have Oligocene age calderas. That's, that's what I have outlined in green. And the, the locus of pull apart activity shifted as the magmatic front shifted. And I'm gonna show you a picture of the gravity in that area that had the 20 to 30 million year calderas. It shows a rhomboid feature. It's probably a gravity low because it's filled with tuff. And I am interpreting that instead of being a, a plateau as, as the current dogma is, that we were looking at a flat floored basin along which these ash flows were traveling. This is, this is you can see the <coughs> outline of the, the green calderas. This is in, in blue here uh, is, is higher gravity. The purple and the white is lower gravity. There is a ridge here. This is, this is the Toyabe range. Uh, showing as a gravity high, that was recognized as a barrier to ash flows. The idea being that it was something sticking up out of the, the big Nevada Plano uh, plateau. But you can also see in the gravity low here, the rhomboid shape to it. It's actually quite well defined. And I would interpret this as a pull apart basin. This, this wall over here was one wall of the pull apart basin. This, this is a gravity low because it's full of, of low density felsic tuff. And the calderas were actually going off within this pull apart basin. A modern analog of that is in Sumatra. This is the 73,000 uh, 73, year old uh, caldera of Toba uh, with Lake Toba. And it's within a pull-apart basin along the Samanco Graben. This is part of the Sunda Arc. Now, about 17 or 18 million years ago, things started to change. Uh, we had change in magma composition. Instead of, of being a lot of andesite with rhyolite, uh, it, it became more of a bimodal suite with felsic and mafic volcanics. This was a period of, of the most rapid exhumation along the, the Ruby Mountains Grant Range hen zone. And slightly after that is when the Northern Nevada Rift started to develop and, and fill with basalts. What was happening at that time was a transition from the sinistral tectonics that had previously been dominant to right lateral, at least on the west side, of, of the basin. 
So the outline that I have here is the outline of, this is the Northern Nevada Rift, this is the Kings River Rift, and, and another arm that's associated with the Kings River Rift. Um, the McDermott Caldera is up in this area right here. <clears throat> so one of the interpretations is that uh, these are somehow related to mantle plume activity. The, the McDermott Caldera shown as, as this circular feature right here was the first of a series of positions of mantle plume volcanic features that produced the Yellowstone uh, track. Um, I think that there's a very good case to be made that this, this track right here, the Snake River Plain, was a pre-existing feature. And I think there's a good case to be made that subduction was still going on at this time. As I said, the magmatic front was, was receding to the southwest, but there were still andesites, which is the hallmark of subduction volcanism. There were andesites of seven million years uh, in the Walker Lane. So I, I would say that this is, this is certainly a hot spot track, but it also was something pre-existing and it probably was a tear in the subducted slab. The other thing that you'll recall is that we've got, we've got basically northeast trending structural zones and yet the magmatic front was a little bit more east-west. It also suggests that there was a, a lopsided subsidence to that subducted slab. So I, I expect that this is a tear zone. I expect that the basalts are actually going to be transitional between volcanic arc and oceanic island or interplate basalts. And these features right here, they have been connected to features that go all the way up to Canada and are suggested to be part of, of interplate rifts. I would suggest that they're probably back arc basin rifts. All right, I'm going to talk a bit about mineralization. How much more time do I have? A minute and a half. A minute and a half. Okay, we can do this. Okay, so the Great Basin is actually a treasure chest. And these are a few of the, the gold deposits. I, I mainly just plotted the ones in northern Nevada, a couple in Utah. And I'm going to focus on the Lahontan Basin because I want to show you something. First of all, the hen zone of, of that basin, which was probably it started in uh, Oligocene time, continued into Miocene time, started out as left lateral, transitioned to right lateral. The hen zone has at one end of it the McDermott caldera. At the same age, at the other end, is the uh, Rawhide Denton caldera complex and deposits both around 16 to 19 million years old. All right, the feature that you see right here is one of the faults which is, is bounding this rhomboid shape topographic low. And what I wanna point out here is that there may actually be a continuous fault here, but what you see are essentially basins and ranges on the edge of the fault. The, the movement on, and development of these basins was not smooth, it was episodic. And there actually were jumps where it wasn't spreading but you had dilation. You had dilation at one point right here, it jumped over, you started having dilation here, creating a grob and it left a range, it, it jumped over again, created another grob and, and it is at these dilational corners that you commonly find ore deposits. This is uh, Hog Ranch right there, which is a 15 million year old deposit. All right, I'm gonna quickly go through uh, how you might uh, use this to find something in a pediment cover, a gravel covered pediment area. So here is, here's a gravity picture of, of the, the Getchell trend. Here's Rabbit Creek. It's at the, the juncture of one of these northwest trending faults and a northeast trending fault. I'm gonna to have to quickly go through this. You can use gravity, horizontal derivatives, to pick out the orientations 
of, of structures that bound these forest and grovens. And the result of doing that exercise, this was the first horst area with, with a small basin up there in the, in the dilational corner where Rabbit Creek is. Subsequently, it left behind a groven, it did a jump, it created, an, it left behind a horse, it created another groven, it jumped again, left a horse, created another groven. Now actually, this could have been occurring simultaneously. I'm just assuming that it actually is occurring episodically, but it could have occurred at the same time. At any rate, it shows that you can use this and gravity to locate areas that may be favorable targets. All right, I'm not gonna talk much about this because we're running out of time, but this is the, a picture of the Carlin trend, the Battle Mountain trend, and the Getchell trend. The Getchell trend actually doesn't stop right there. It keeps on going. You can see a bit of left lateral offset across the East Range. This is the Humboldt Range. And even though there are Obviously, northwest trending features here that are actually defined by the gravity. They're, they're trends of igneous intrusions that had hydrothermal systems. What you can see is that the clusters of deposits actually commonly have a north-south orientation to them. And that's because they're controlled by normal faults. So these trends were primarily controlled by tertiary right lateral strike slip uh, and oblique faults. And within those trends, a lot of the clusters of mineralization, the hydrothermal centers were controlled by normal faults. All right, so I'm gonna show a picture of the, the Carlin trend. And this is an example of, of how you actually can see clusters of deposits with a north-south orientation, other deposits which, which tend to define northwest southeast orientations, such as Gold Quarry on down to Rain. And then here is the, the railroad pinion area with a north-south trend. These north-south trends would be dilational jogs in between uh, strike slick se segments, which are northwest southeast. All right, that's on a, a district scale, a more regional scale, but you can see this interplay of northwest, northeast, and north-south structures on a deposit scale also, and pipeline is a great example of this. This is the northwestern and Cortez trend, which is a right lateral strike slip fault. Gold Rush actually is another one of these sets of, of dilational jogs. Um, and it's, the Cortez trend is intersecting a north-south structure uh, which, which defines south pipeline. And you can see by the elongation of the pits that these structures were real and mineralized. And both of those intersect a northeast structure which, which essentially forms the, the range bounding fault. This is a 20 million ounce deposit and it's a good example of, of how the intersection of these three fault trends localized hydrothermal alteration. All right, I'll stop there. I did it. Amazing. Thanks for that very interesting overview of the Great Basin. That was fantastic. Would you be willing to discuss more later if people are interested? We have a yes, so stick around. Uh, we're going to keep trucking, and we've got one more talk before our break. So now for something completely different, <laughs> um, let me introduce Scott McMally from Cripple Creek. Scott is a project geologist for Newmont at Cripple Creek and Victor. He has held various operational and exploration roles over his six-year career there. He graduated with his bachelor's in geology from Colorado State University. Come on up, Scott. All right. Well, let's uh, have a little overview of the Cripple Creek and Victor gold mine today. So Cripple Creek is an alkaline hosted epithermal gold deposit located here in Colorado. 
it's approximately in a tertiary age, so 33 to 28 million years ago, with mineralization being younger than that. And it's a historic district with production greater than 20 million ounces of gold. And its current iteration, it's a bulk tonnage open pit mine with two heap leach facilities, and we have a smaller amount of float mill production. We have four active pits, approximately 560 full-time employees. It's owned and operated by Newmont, and we're a high altitude operation with our benches between 9,000 and 10,000 feet above sea level. And we have a robust exploration program with underground potential. So we're located about three hours from here, depending on traffic, at the uh, southern end of the Colorado Front Range Mountains. And in Colorado, there's a structure called the, the Mineral Belt of Colorado, or Colorado Mineral Belt. But Cripple Creek is located here, so it's an outlier from this historic structure where a lot of precious metal mining took place. So looking at an overview of the mine, we have a relatively small footprint compared to the gold endowment, and it's much smaller than a Carlin type operation. So on either side of us, we have the communities of Cripple Creek and Victor. And you can see we're also quite close to these communities. So that's a sensitive issue for us that we have to uh, maintain our good neighbor status. We have Pikes Peak up here and Woodland Park, which is where a lot of employees live. Uh, we've got our older VLF here and our newer VLF here with a recovery plant for each one, as well as the uh, mill. So Cripple Creek is a historic district. It was uh, discovered in 1890 by a uh, cowboy named Bob Womack who was panning for float gold. And he found some high grade stuff. And once the word got out, people, uh, it quickly became a gold rush district. And in, somewhere around 1893, it was a tent city that looked like this, about 10,000 people, and then 50,000 residents by the turn of the century. And this was all underground mining and uh, people would come from all over to try and get rich quick. So in the early days, that was all accomplished with hand steel and donkeys pulling ore carts out of mines. But as operations became successful and had better funding, they were able to afford better surface plants like this so they could uh, progress to steam powered equipment like jack legs, which enabled a much uh, greater rate of production uh, much more quickly. And all of the, well, not all of it, but the bulk of the ore was shipped to Colorado City, which is located in what's now called Colorado Springs. And there was a mill there. And they used various cyanide and chlorine processes to recover that gold. So here's a map showing the extent of the workings, because this is a extensively underground mined district. And these shapes are showing the endowment or production level from each of these different mines. And there was over 500 mines in the district all competing with one another. But what's important about this figure is the biggest producers were all down here closer to Victor. And these mines were all 2.5 million ounce or more, with the uh, Portland being 4 million ounces of gold. And in this histogram here, we can see our gold production over the years. So it quickly ramped up to 900,000 ounces around the turn of the century. And then after that, there was a steady decline. And then closer to World War I, things really started to decline. And in the period of World War I to World War II, the miners were facing water in the mines as well as uh, lower grades and having to go deeper. So in general, production started to taper off. And after World War II, there's very little going on in the district. And then in the early 90s and late 80s, the beginnings of what the operation is now started. So all that underground mining left quite a legacy that, we, that will always be part of Cripple Creek. So in this map, we see our workings color-coded by depth, with the lowest depths being around here. And you can see that a lot of these very deep workings are located in this area, because these were the major players in the district. And there's actually far less workings over here closer to Cripple Creek. So Cripple Creek kind of gets the fame, but Victor is where the, the real money was made. Um, if we look at this in an oblique view, this is one of our pits 
going through the Crescent underground mine and the pit is named the Crescent pit after that. And we're essentially exhuming old workings. We're mining the wall rock of the stuff they left behind because they were chasing high grade. But to us, it's economic. So as a result of this, one of the greatest engineering challenges we have is extensive underground workings. Now, those can be very dangerous. What we typically see in our high walls or even on our benches is giant caves or stopes. And they could be supported with old timbers and they can basically go on in any sort of geometry. Sometimes we've blasted through them and some of them are hundreds of feet deep and could easily swallow a haul truck. So why is there a gold deposit here? The central structure in the district is a, a volcanic diatreme. So along the edges of this, the country rock is all Precambrian. It's various granites and metamorphic rocks. And they're all uh, Precambrian with the metamorphics being the oldest rocks in the district. And cutting through that at a much younger time from the uh, Oligocene era is the, the volcanic diatreme, which is primarily composed of breccia, which is here in yellow. And in blue, we have a, a sequence of phonolites. And there's many different types of intrusives that cut through the breccia. Uh, the reason this is thought to exist here is that there was an extensional tectonic regime occurring somewhere around this time that enabled the crust to be a little bit thinner here which allowed a magma chamber to supply all this material and erupt on the surface. We have some general trends in the district structurally that go north-northwest, approximately like this, with some lesser northeast trends, but many of the productive veins followed this trend. If we look at a typical cross-section, what we have here is a, a leapfrog model we produced from all of our logging. And what we see coming through one of our pit shells is our volcanic breccia and then these large irregular stalks of phonolite. And the phonolites is kind of a, uh, a garbage can term. We, we lump things to make it possible to model it. Really, they're, they're more like uh, tephrites, phonotephrites, tephraphonolites, trachytes, and a, a number of other alkaline intrusives. Cutting through all of this in pink, we have aphanitic phonolites, which typically occur as vertical or subvertical dikes. And then cutting through those in green, we have lamprophires, which are the youngest rock in the district, and they're a high pressure, high temperature rock. And then perhaps uh, around the same time or slightly younger is this structure that we call the crescent pipe. And this is a lamprophire breccia pipe which is thought to have a, a root system that goes down as, as far as we've been able to drill. Um, where we often find gold is where we have intersections of these dikes with the breccia. The breccia is a little bit porous, so it makes a good host for hydrothermal fluids. So contacts are generally what you're looking for. We don't often find gold in the middle of a huge block of impermeable phonolite. So what is a diatreme? It's not this thing, that's an echidna, which is a weird Australian creature. Um, this is what it would be theorized to look like. So sort of a carrot or conical shaped structure that is a uh, pipe comprised of many, many different sequences of explosive volcanism that produce uh, different types of breccias with presumably at depth, a magma chamber or a system of feeder dikes that supply this. And then cutting through that, you have a number of different younger dikes. So it's kind of similar to kimberlite pipes where you could find diamonds. Uh, also to note is throughout all this, you would have uh, an extensive hydrothermal system with steam and vapor phases percolating through it. So the breccia we find is uh, <coughs> the dominant rock type we see everywhere. It's a heterolithic breccia and it's all uh, remnants of previous phonolites and other rocks that have been co-minuted together. And in some cases, you'll have breccia clasts within the breccia. So there's evidence of multiple generations. And oftentimes we'll find bits of Precambrian clasts in there, especially if we're closer to the edge of the diatreme, like here. Throughout the district, there were, um, and throughout the, uh, the 
evolution of the deposit, there were periods of quiet where the eruptions would stop and sediments and lakes could form. And we found lake sediments. These are kind of rare and usually they're, they're quite small. And then you'll find them that they were uh, smothered by another sequence of eruptions. And the, the clasts can range from millimeter scale to all the way to something larger than a house. Also throughout, you'll find a lot of fluorite dikes, and this occurs as massive purple fluorite, typically. Now, this is often associated with gold, but at Cripple Creek, you really can't just look at a rock and tell right away if it's going to be high grade or not, unless you see visible gold or gold minerals. Uh, sometimes we'll find a boring rock like this that has no discernible features in it that would indicate gold, but then it ends up running pretty high. So I mentioned there's a lot of intrusive bodies throughout the district. And these are typically considered to be alkaline rocks, meaning they have a lot of sodium and potassium, and they're lower in calcium, and they're also silica undersaturated. So what you often will see is uh, phonolites that look like this. They have a porphyritic texture, and they're composed of feldspathoids like nepheline, and you could have plagioclase as well. These things can come in and do a number of different features like this where they could bifurcate and then anastomose and rejoin. They could be vertical like this. Some of them will auto brecciate themselves as they cool or they'll form drag folds as they intrude. And in some cases, we even have columnar jointing in some of the larger irregular stocks. What we also see when we're logging core typically is, since we're targeting structures, is lamprophyre dikes, which are, it's a greenish black rock and it has these oval features called oceli, which are a, thought to be a, a gas vesicle that was later filled in with calcite. What's in, important usually is the contact between the dikes and the breccia. This typically doesn't have gold inside of it. It's the contact where this goes into the wall rock that, that typically is what hosts gold. Also, uh, just as a bit of trivia, there's over 20 satellite intrusive bodies throughout the region that are contemporaneous with the diatreme, but they're all barren or sub-economic. Pretty much all the rocks in the district are altered, and what we typically see will be rims, usually potassic alteration, which will uh, flood the entire matrix, and uh, basically it turns everything into agillaria. And that can be associated with mineralization, but not always. And then Throughout the district, you'll see locally intense hydrothermal alteration or dissolution that'll form secondary quartz and many types of clays. And that can often be uh, mineralized as well. So where is the gold at Cripple Creek? Uh, it occurs in uh, primarily three different varieties. So we have native gold, you have gold tellurides, which I'll cover in a minute, and then you have sulfide ore or arsenian pyrite. So in this example, we have native gold intergrown with different sulfides. And the most common we see is pyrite. Also, we get a class of minerals called tellurides, which Cripple Creek's kind of known for, which are a rare class of mineral that can actually form a chemical bond with gold. And then tellurides are oxidized relatively easily, and they will leave behind native gold as a remain. And this can be quite hard to identify in hand sample because it tends to have a cinnamon color and it can look very much like limonite. So limonite is a common rock all over the place. So anytime you have oxidation, you see this cinnamon colored stuff, you wouldn't even give it a second thought. But if you look at it under high power in a microscope, it's, it's this powdery gold, but it doesn't have the luster of gold to the eye. Uh, and that can form all of these weird inner growths that are occurring with sulfides and other telluride species. And then what makes up a, a significant portion of gold at Cripple Creek is, is pyrite grains that have elevated levels of arsenic. And arsenic tends to be associated with gold at pretty much every deposit. So where you see a spike in arsenic is uh, somebody with this uh, electron microprobe, they, they found elevated levels of gold as they did a traverse across this crystal of pyrite. So the tellurides are 
really uh, an interesting mineral species. Their uh, tellurium is actually an element that's a metalloid, and it's, it's one of the few things that can actually form compounds with gold. So these are very valuable ores, and they're high-grade ores that we would ship to our mill. Uh, the principal species that we like to see is calaverite, which is one gold to two tellurium atoms. And you can also add silver to the system, and there's a decent amount of silver at Cripple Creek, and that can form a species called crenorite or sylvanite. And all of these contain gold. And in hand sample, they would look something like this. They have a very high reflectance. They're metallic minerals, and they have prominent striations. And they tend to be twinned like this, and they form bladed crystals. Uh, they can, they're also very small. They're usually millimeter scale or centimeters at best. So they look very similar to pyrite. And pyrite can also have striations and be pretty reflective too. So identifying them is, can be challenging. And the main test is hardness because tellurides are very soft. And you can scratch them with a pocket knife, whereas pyrite's pretty hard. And um, there is some form of electrum occurring in the system, but it's typically uh, occurring here over towards the gold phase. And tellurides also can form many other compounds. And you can have coloradoite, which is mercury telluride, and nickel tellurides, lead tellurides, copper tellurides. So they're a, uh, a significant part of the story at Cripple Creek. One of the more interesting things about the district that it's famous for is the discovery of this feature called the Crescent Vug. And this was a natural cavity that was found in the Crescent Mine, uh, some thousand feet underground. And it was a, approximately a 15 by 10 by five foot uh, natural cavity in the rock that was completely lined with this all over the place. Thousands of crystals and uh, amazing ones by accounts, as well as native gold forming crystals and, and wire structures. So they, when they found this, they immediately barricaded it off so the miners couldn't get in there because old time miners love to high grade and no modern miners do that though, ever. So um, th they were afraid of this just being emptied out in a shift by miners because it, it was a, a wonder. So they, they guarded it and then they mined it and they reported to uh, have extracted 60,000 ounces of gold out of just that one area. And supposedly this is the only known photograph of it. And these little white spots on here, I would assume to be tellurides because they have such a high reflectance, but it's really hard to tell what you're looking at here. Uh, this could be a NASA picture of an asteroid for all you know, but it was supposedly on the 1200 foot level. And uh, we've, I actually planned a drill hole and I think I hit it, but I'm not sure. It's, yeah. it's really hard to tell. So, and they also mined out the uh, five feet around it, a pretty good rind. And then the gold assays basically went back to background level. So whatever was in there, they, they scraped it out pretty good. So I just wanted to finish up here with a couple of uh, curiosities and interesting things that we find in the district. So this is carbonized wood here. And what this is, is uh, I was mentioning that there were periods of quiescence and uh, trees and flora would uh, exist on the surface at this time. And then a volcanic eruption would happen and that would be co uh, completely smothered by volcanic rock and encased in solid rock. But the, the material itself didn't completely disintegrate. It just burned and, and was smothered and encased and preserved like this. So we find this uh, throughout the district, primarily in the Crescent Pit. It can have a little bit of calcite around the edges. But if you look closely at it, you can see what looks like fibers. And it looks like what, what you would find in a campfire. Uh, it's also got a lot of uranium in it because the uh, carbon apparently locks up uranium. The other thing we find are lake sediments in some of these uh, areas of the mine. And these samples today are actually really scarce. I've, I've never seen them in any of the pits. Uh, they were only found in one of the pits that was mined in the early 2000s actually, but there were a number of fossils that were found on one of the, uh, the walls on the bench. And then lastly uh, is uh, a rare mineral specimen called credite. 
And it's a nice collector specimen. It's typically orange, but the varieties that came from Cripple Creek were purple. Uh, we probably saw this the last time about four years ago and hasn't been seen since. And of course, Tellurides. People are crazy about Tellurides and everyone wants Tellurides. So Cripple Creek is a geologically complex gold deposit epithermal and it's tertiary in age. It has a high gold endowment relative to its footprint. It was all high grade underground mining historically, and today it's low grade bulk tonnage open pit mining. And collectively the district is at approximately uh, 25 million ounces. In our current operation <coughs> we've produced just over 5 million ounces. And it's a known type locality for calaverite, sylvanite, and kernerite telluride specimens. <laughs> 